and three and two and one Sally and everybody hope you're all doing good and what I came on to discuss today is uh, the material that reflects idealism these ideals that say that the Afro-Asiatic is from Africa. That the black man is from Africa. That Abraham is from Africa. That the Israelites are from Africa. And just to show you some of this. Abraham's land grant northeast africa and beyond 10 months ago this person's whole goal by the channel name is restoring africa to the bible what happened when i saw abraham in heaven and what he said about africa who knows right was abraham born in nigeria of the Chaldees was Esau in the land of the Air Congo four weeks ago so Abraham in the land of Chaldees when we sit here and see this being used we know they're just going to argue that more Africa so Abrahamic religions and Africa African writers today and Abraham in the historical context. And let's see. Okay, that's great. Farmer. <laughs> I wonder. Canaan and the Canaanites in the Bible, sons of Ham series, right? And then what do they show you? The Bible mentions the Canaanites at least 349 times, but they just show you what you've been, we've been taught to call black people. So, of course, this is teaching anybody who glances over, right? Abraham is in Africa, but the Africans are Canaanites, right? Abraham's journey, right? Of course, they're going to say it was that. Abraham saw the promised land, Central Africa. So, you see this over and over again, right? The African origin of Christianity, Abraham. So, again, Abraham never discussed no Africa. He never discussed any Christianity. Christianity is a religion that is based off of the worship of the Queen Mother of Heaven and her son, and which the image which is an idol. Okay, so Abraham destroyed his father's idols. So again, it is it is just it's a great disrespect. It's a dishonor to even claim Christianity stems from Abraham. Christians were what? Were Roman people. So they say it was the subjects of Rome. That's totally different than saying Roman people. So that's someone Rome is subjugating. You are oppressed. You are being subjugated. Portions of your tax dollars go right to this place. No different. So, people's belief in the past, it conquers what the past actually was. So, if we look down here, some new receipt is going to come up. All right. So, we have KRS-1 makes a song called why is that claiming that abraham 
was a, a black man in Egypt. Fair use. In the United States of America, Canada, and the rest of the world, there is a conspiracy. And that conspiracy, ladies and gentlemen, is this word called black. The word black quite literally means no standing in law, and it also makes reference to dead people. So when you use the word like black nigger, nigger, or when you use the word black in any context or agreement with people, what you are basically saying is that they are dead. However, the... Now y'all see how he did through the Seville to more two on screen? All right? See that shit? People know, bro. Like, they be knowing. And this is what I be trying to get people to understand. Like, when I made the interracial video, when I was talking about how we're at the bottom and everything, why would any group of people want to be with us? Why? Okay, so I want you to keep in mind the music industry, the sports industry. Mm -hmm. TV, the movies, all want you to call yourself black. Now, in the TV, in the movies, in the sports industry, it is people that look like you saying to each other, on screen, as a black man, I'm black, I'm black, 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 black. Now, here's the difference. On their official government documentation, they already filled out paperwork stating what they are with the government. And it's American. Again, if you don't understand what's going on, as long as you have a SS, you are a tax servant. These people are you are businesses, so on their paperwork they don't use their social security number; they use their business numbers. Now, all businesses are taxable. That's when you get into other numbers like your estate number from a trust. Can they tax the trust? They cannot tax the foreign trust. Now, you see, people are, and they cannot tax Indians. Now, what are they doing? Since 1924, white men are labeled as Indians, and then they put these, what? What do you say about the caste system? Yeah. People know, bro. Like, they be knowing. And this is what I be trying to get people to understand. Like, when I made the interracial video, when I was talking about how we're at the bottom and everything. So we're at the bottom of the caste system. Right? What is that? What's underneath? What's just the bottom? In the dirt. What's in the dirt? Dead. This is the game that they're playing with us. This is what I've been saying once, over and over again. So, these people, right? Now, and then the government, they go and do something really slick. It's a racist country where the, they taught themselves they're white. Not which country they're from. Not what forefather they're from that they're white and they taught you you're black you're black you're black no color is allowed no this now you're black no blacks allowed black white this is what the game is now they came from a system where the black man they made the system so the black man wouldn't have a snowball's chance in hell unless and now Again, if they're pretending to be you, pretending to be the Indian because of acts, the Indian Act, right? And now they they release these Freemasons to work 
and those Freemasons will pay the tax, right? Until they reach a certain area, and then they say, okay, you can use your real identity now. Remember, in, in, in Florida, when we watch this dude's video about Pensacola, Florida, in Florida, secretly, they, they honor this Prince, uh, Prince Hall. Okay? Keep this in mind. They honor this Prince Hall. That is their master. So it's like I've always said, the black Freemasons are over the white Freemasons, but they have to keep up this presumption. Now, the government's clearly controlled visually by, by, by white people under this, but it's not. It's truly Gog, Magog, Goth. This is what racism is actually hiding. They tell you it's a racial war and you think, oh, white people win racism because they control everything. But the secret Freemasons of blacks that they all worship are over them and they're telling them to do all this stuff. And then we keep on hearing about black Germany you know, is that goth or not? Or, 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 or is that e Edom? Soon, this stuff will be revealed because that Bible says what's going to happen with Edom. So, that Bible says it's a superiority. The only superiority that you can have is supremacy. And we know that as racial supremacy, period. That don't mean everybody understands and everybody's involved. But you know, look who goes and applies for these government positions. If we don't apply ourselves to this. How can we expect? Hmm? So, look, please remember this KRS One is one of these people that sold us out a long time ago because these are the people in any con that taught us this textual agreement with people what you are basically saying is that they are dead however the now y'all see how he did through the Seville to more two song screen all right see that shit people know bro like they be knowing and this is what I be trying to get people to understand. Like when I made the interracial video, when I was talking about how we're at the bottom and everything, why would any group of people want to be with us? Why? Now this helps you understand that I'm not the only one that look at this shit the way that I do. How many times I told y'all in videos in the past, Dre Scott lost his case in court for calling himself black and black alone. So, he said, Another video I want to go over. Uh, now, I've explained many times, if you Google the books called, or the subject matter, white slave books, what comes up? to a person that went to school and every face that you thought was truly there for you, every face taught you that you were an African brought here on slave ships. And this subject matter should be mind-blowing. Just mind-blowing. Because white slave books shows that white people were the slaves that were brought over here. Okay? Now, I'll show you. Fair use. Let's go to the oldest maps of the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert, the largest desert in the world. 
and they tell us that this desert is around 10,000 years old. Well, depending on where you look, five to 10,000 years old, they say this has been a desert for. But is that true? Because we have maps from the 15, 16, and 1700s that show this whole region as green with lakes, rivers, and cities all the way through it. So let's jump in and have a look at the Sahara and how long has it really been a desert for? channel hope you are having a fantastic day and of course autodidactic means to be self-educated and we all need to be self-educated <coughs> because if we're not the only choice we have left is to believe what other people tell us other people like the government and the establishment and those who write uh historical books shall we say so that's what we're going to look into today is the story and specifically the sahara they tell us it's been a desert for thousands of years, but is that true? Let's get into it. Five words. And so this, again, this is important because we're told that their children will come to the mm, standing or statements that they were taught lies, they were taught traditions. Now, because their children were your teachers and their approved literature to teach us was lies. This is what we do here. We analyze these lies to get the truth, to move forward in the direction that we need to be in because we are on a different path than they are. We are the goal. We are the reason they taught their children lies. The sun, rippling sand, and hidden oases, they often picture the Sahara. But 11,000 years ago, oh, yeah. you know, today's world's yes. largest hot desert would have been unrecognizable. The now desiccated north strip of Africa was once green and alive, pocketed with lakes, rivers, grasslands, and even forests. So where did all the water go? And we're on Wikipedia here, and it says uh, this is the African humid period, which is a climate period in Africa during the Pleistocene to Homeocene geologic epochs when northern Africa was wetter than today. The covering of much of the Sahara was deserted by grasses, trees, and lakes, and was caused by changes in the Earth's orbit around the sun. Changes in vegetation and dust in the Sahara reengthened the African monsoon and increased greenhouse gases, of course. Um, so during the preceding last glacial maximum or ice age, the Sahara contained extensive dune fields and was mostly uninhabited. It was much larger than today, but its lakes and rivers such as Lake Victoria and the White Nile were either dry or at low levels. The humid period began about 14 and a half thousand years ago, and the African humid period ended six, uh, five to six thousand years ago. So that they're saying sort of, yeah, uh, 15, five to 15,000 years ago is when it was green by their story. Then there was a cold period. Uh, while some evidence points to an end five and a half thousand years ago, the period appears to have taken place in several steps and blah, blah, blah. So if we come down here to the history, uh, we have research issues. While well, the precipitation changes since the last glacial cycle are well established, the magnitude and timing of the changes are unclear. Depending on how and where measurements and reconstructions are made, different beginning dates and ending dates and durations and precipitation levels have been determined for the African humid period. So they're saying that, <laughs> that they give us these times for this period, but when they run their tests, they're, getting, they're not getting consistent results for anything, for the start of it, the end of it, the participation levels, all this stuff. 
the amounts of precipitation reconstructed from the paleoclimatic records and simulated by the climate model are often inconsistent with each other. In general, the simulation of the Green Sahara is considered a problem for Earth system models. Maybe that's because it's wrong and it was actually green three or four hundred years ago. Uh, erosion of lake sediments and carbon reservoir effects make it difficult to date when they dried up. So why do they tell us they know the dates? You see, this is this is the thing, right? It's all in the details. Uh, vegetation changes by themselves do not necessarily indicate precipitation changes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically, they tell us, you know, this is when it happened up here. Definitely started, you know, fourteen thousand six hundred to fourteen thousand five hundred years ago, ended five to six thousand, and then you get down here, and they're like, well, we don't actually know because all the things we get are different from each other. Uh, so this is the thing. The oh, we're going to show you <coughs> the answer to this. Because they're trying to date stuff off of rocks. But we're trying to date how long life has been in there. Meaning, man. So, in a minute, meaning like in a half hour, we're going to watch a geneticist discuss it. And he's going to discuss why the dates are off. And if you take the dates from human graves, instead, it will match the Bible. And then, and only then, will the time periods make sense. So, let's continue with this. African human <coughs> is when they're saying the Sahara was green. I uh, said so 5,000 years ago. Fair so use. Is it true or was it green? Fair use. Much, much more recently. Let's have a look. All right. So it is sand right now. All right. And in the movie, now again, Vincent knows this by heart. You know, this wouldn't be, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance, you know, favorite song. He knows this by heart. Now remember, he just told you Africa used to be grain, a beautiful land, grass everywhere. Something happened, it turned to sand. So from where we got uh, Planet of the Apes, the 29th scroll, the sixth verse, beware the beast man for he is the devil's pawn alone among God's primates for he kills for sport. He kills for lust, he kills for greed. Yea, will he will murder his brother to possess his brother's land. Let him not inbreed, excuse me, let him not breed in great numbers, for he will make a desert of his home and of yours. Now, I've been saying this. For a while now, look at America turning into a desert. Different pockets of America. Oh, where these cities were. Huh? Shun him, drive him back into his jungle lair, for he is the harbinger of death. Everybody knows the most famous jungle is the Congo. We like to believe it's the Amazon, but they don't know what's in the Amazon. They know what's in the Congo. Now, let's look a little further and learn what we're going to learn. We're going to have to combine some, some new studies. Fair use. Fair use. Okay, so here we have a Including map including autodidactic and what he's doing okay so we say here we have a map let's get this map this is from 1707 as you can see here and this is of barbaria barbaria so here we go bye bye bar 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 you see that Bree burrs. See that don't say no. Berbers. 
it say Breebers. So, hmm, dear KRS One, um, this is a good map to show the Berbers been in Africa. Okay, so who are the Berbers? Hold on, this is going, this is going to be kind of weird. Hold on. Hold on, man. Because, see, again, you're going to talk about, you're going to talk about the Bible, but don't know how no concept of what's in the Bible. Right? And it, 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 it tell you in the beginning they went to the land of Shinar. So, I mean, that's not Africa. So, let's say, what would be a good video for this one, huh? Ancient Egyptians. So, I mean, yeah, who, who's the flavor, flavor, run around with the clock, you know? All these dudes from the you know eighties and nineties running around with these symbols of Africa, you know, singing about Tennessee and shit, and shit don't make sense. All right. Fair ah. use. I'll show you why. Archaeological discoveries, but some are more famous than others. You've all heard of the pyramids of Egypt and the Colosseum of Rome, for example. But there are other discoveries that are just as worthy of your attention, yet barely receive any. We're going to try to do something about it with this video of stunning, but mostly unknown, fantastic archaeological finds. You'd expect to find a place with a name like the Cave of Hercules in Greece or Italy, but it's actually in Tangier, Morocco. The cave, or to be more accurate, <coughs> caves, are set into one of the most northwestern points on the African <coughs> continent and are steeped in so much myth and legend that it's hard to tell what's real about their history and what isn't. One of these myths says that the caves were visited by Hercules himself, hence the name. He slept in the caves, <coughs> stealing three apples from the garden of the Hesperides as one of his twelve labors. Now, the Hesperides should instantly instantly Hesperides that should instantly remind people of the word Hispanic now <clears throat> when you go look up Hesperides they don't want to give you nothing about people because the Hispanics were controlling the history the Council of the Indies so they hid the day from Africa because they got the most to lose, even though they hold the documents given to them by the Pope. So the Hesperides or the Hispanics, they were in Africa. Now, I'm sure they're going to look, if you type in Hesperides, it's going to say it's one person. Where did the name come from? Who was the people that worshipped this character? Hesperia, Hesperides of Hesperia with the Hesperians people, and today we call them the Hispanics. If the Moors was in Spain, you, then you got a problem. You can't say this body of people was there at the same time as the other body of people. You see the problem in history that the Gentile presents. So, look a little further in this, because this is where the answers are. Fair use. A different legend says the cave network is so long that it runs for 15 miles reaching Spain. While a third claims that Gibraltar's macaque monkeys only made it to Gibraltar because they left Africa via the caves. So clearly there's a cave system that runs. That's that's uh, one cave opening that leads to a cave system that goes between the two continents, showing that they're, they're connected. 
so we're gonna go further because again when the spanish come down to mexico right they're, they're, they're sitting there saying again and there's two people saying that they're spanish there's the melanated people that was actually in europe and then there's the african hispanic that we call the mexican and in, in, in hispanic today the latin is with this esau which are dark people now all you have to do is start putting the pieces together based on the travels of edom he went to Mount Seir. Mount Seir is the same stuff that they call the Italian Alps, the French Alps, the Sierra Mountains. None of these stories are true, but the truth is even more amazing. The caves aren't natural. Clearly these stories are true. And the, the, the truth of it is, is the water probably rose and the caves are now uh, underwater. Now, that shows you right there who was in Africa. And listen, one more time, uh, let me get this down. They take advantage of natural features, but the first opening to them was carved by the Phoenicians more than 2,000 years ago. Okay, so now you got Ham's children, the Phoenicians, on Africa soil, carving stuff up, landmarks, right? These are legal stakes. We don't think of it today. It's no different than street signs. The second opening was added centuries later by the local Berbers. By the Berbers. Now, if we go looking at the Berbers, it's going to say some sources that they're Phoenicians, and other sources is going to say that there's, there's part Philistines. This is the beauty of it. How can the black man in such racist turmoil today have been in Africa alongside the Phoenicians or the Philistines or the Berbers. So, and, uh, oh, we, we was Hercules. Oh, so you the Greek now. Now you're admitting something about black Greeks. So again, Tell us very clearly. But the first opening to them was carved by the Phoenicians more than 2,000 years ago. The second opening was added centuries later by the local Berbers. So we should understand that. And we should pretty much respect that because all we're going to do is we're just going to go back over here. and combine it with what we're going to see now. After this commercial, we'll be right back. Fair use. Our desert was Barbaria, as we can see here. And this is of Barbaria, as this region was called. The Sahara Desert was Barbaria. As we can see here, no Barbary. So, all we have to do is pause this and just start looking around. It's that easy. See, because we should sit there, we should say, oh, see here, say Judah, don't it? No, it doesn't. Oh, see here, somebody there is fighting in the Bible. It's that. No, 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 that wasn't it. Oh, wait, 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 right here. Oh, this says Sarah desert right of the barbie oh see we found we found the name of abraham's wife right see this is a problem with this so-called black man he does not have his leader 
He's been brainwashed to think, ah, I'm the individual, and with individuality, I can win. Yeah, they formed the League of This, they formed Council of This, right? With different nations, they joined together to take you down. And that's when you were whole. <laughs> now you're the individual. Prideful. Calling on wrong gods. Calling on Yah the moon god. Hey, you, it doesn't work. You got to sacrifice humans or animals to him and put it in the water. That is, you can't just, right? Oh, no, I mean the most high. No, you got to call him by his actual name. And that's what he said. You shall call me this forever. I do not acknowledge the title the most high, but that is my title. That's not his name. I'll pray to the most high. How many things claim the titles of the most high? So again, the people that have been in place to be your leaders, they are paid to keep you stuck in a dead legal status. Don't they tell you to worship a dead god? nailed to a cross, a pagan symbol of death. So, I mean, it's very clear. Conan the Barbarian made it very clear. They put thieves and murderers on this cross. So, Rome, hmm, going down in Africa, right? Here's Tunis, that's the Tunisians, right? Hmm? That's that's those slave ones, white slaves. Algeria, Tunisia. Mm, there's Alger, Alger. See, there's Tunis, right? This Morocco, Morocco. Oh, it's been Morocco forever. No, they ain't called Morocco. Is he? See, R de Morocco, huh? R de Morocco. That sound kind of French. They sound like the French people left. Africa after they all burnt it the fuck up, turned it to sand, and what invaded Europe and Les Algeris Bribeiros Bribeiros Bad from Africa but, but he was talking in French Right uh. It's so easy to trick them and take their country. We tell them from, they're from Africa. Like, this is how, this is how they were singing back in the day, right? We tricked these Negroes and they took their land. Right? Hi, engine, play that engine drum. Uh, well, we're going to take that title, too. We took these lands from these dumb ass niggas and we're going to make it. Right? This is the same thing. They take your shit, and then, right, here, they sat Arabs. Hmm? Ville. Who, who uses Ville? Ville. I'll feel fatir. Okay. Right? They. See? These names ain't used today. Want to know why? Because these are the real names of the real Africans. And if you type these names in, it's going to tell you about white people. And now they don't force black people into this. And again, the Europeans with dark skin and straight hair don't come down and force it's oppression on these other black people because we're going to check the DNA, dude. The DNA is going to tell us they came from Asia into Africa. 
was going to tell us. Everybody did. But right here, by language, you can, these is the people that say they French and say they Germans today. <laughs> they played us. Well, they played our ancestors. And today, there's so many saps. So many uneducated people with strong, proud mentalities that you can't tell them they've been taught wrong. Remember, KRS-One made all kinds of money for teaching these things. KRS-One got videos say, oh, they made our album, sold it to the black community, took the money and made warheads. So, and then you went back to work the next day. I'm black, you black, we black, we's from Africa. Here's your money. Good job tricking them. Here, 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 let's, let's hear what the white man says as he looks at these and they say Arabs everywhere and these, huh? These Frenchy French names. See, this is what nobody wants to admit. Look what he say. 300 years ago, it was green. It didn't take him long. Let me read this one more time. Beware of the beast, man. Didn't we see ma maps of Africa with all kinds of strange creatures and shit? Beware of the beast, man, for he is the devil's pawn, alone, all among God's primates. Where's the primates at? Where are all the monkeys at? Man, we just now know in Asia, they are... Africa is the mother of all things, for he kills for sport. What happened to the rhino, the rhinoceros? What happened to the elephant? For lust, for greed. Yea, he will murder his brother to possess his land. Where they tell you the story of America. White people came and put with, with, with black people on boats and, and kept the black people in, in chains. Why, why they why they went and they killed all the people that were native to the land? That's that's what they told you. This lost the lie they told you. Martin Luther King got killed because he said Plymouth Rock landed on us. That means the Spanish and the Portuguese brought their Caucasian or white slaves from Africa, excuse me, Caucasians are from the Caucasus Mountains. They brought their white slaves from Africa and promised them freedom to take the land from the dark skinned Afro peoples that were brought here much before. The Mexicans, Mexico is where they were dropped off at. This was, was, we, we learned a, a lot following these roads. Let him not breed in large numbers. Oh, but he can, unless he, you count IVF. Not, let him not, but that's what they say, IVF is breeding. God said to four million people, I'm sorry, you can't have no children anymore. Four million people turned to science and said, Dear scientists, with the lab coat, with your maize and your wat and your cheese, can you please duplicate us? For he will make a desert of his home. We have the technology to prove this. Six million dollar man. Look at this sand barren ass wasteland. You will not believe the oasis this used to be. Again, everybody leaves from Babylon. These guys go to the land that they're actually supposed to be in. They're there for a brief amount of time. And whatever they're doing there, they turn it to sand. And then they leave there. In chains. 
They come over here, the remainder of them invade Europe. Now, we're going to see the DNA going to show us who is who. The closer we get to the to the last moment, right, right before the bombs go off, when, when the bombs go off, there's no more, no more internet, no way to prove any of this. It's, it's done. It's survival of the fittest, right? So, let's go a little further in this. And we will shun him as, as soon as people start talking boycott. That's when they get clipped. What's your boy talking? Fair con. Fair. Fair con. He's talking boycott. He's he lining himself up to get clipped. He might be having medical problems. Look. If I was in that man's position. And I was having medical problems. I would be looking to get martyred. I would be like, if they take me out, the people will think so highly of me like they do Malcolm. <laughs> oh my God. But they think you killed Malcolm. So why would they think so? <laughs> Our next episode, we will talk about drive him back into his jungle lair. Hmm? Everybody go back to their father's home, for he is the harbinger of death. What did they come here and do? They came here and things were so good, they created the atomic bomb. I have become the harbinger of death. Oh. God damn, it matches that verse! And then what do they do, right? The, the, the doctor... Dr. Feelgood riding that damn bomb down there. I forgot what that, that Dr. Love. I forgot. I, that was that was before my time. But all of this match, it's amazing. Fair use. Stop using these videos against us. We have, Fair use. Oh, man. Let's try that one more time, please. Now, Fair use. Oops, you just you messed that shit up too. This is the Sahara Desert, and as you can see, it's covered in rivers. These are all rivers that go to lakes. Okay, these are all lakes. We have towns. These it's a booth. are towns and settlements. These tents, I'm not sure what the tents are. It's sort of, you know, just settlements or bases. The name is shit. The, the sound that that you that when you spit tafalet 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 fillet fillet of fish I like a, a what what do they call this a tapia tapal tilapia 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 fillet fill it you want it a tilapia fillet, a t fillet. Look at them, all living in tents. Hmm. What's the difference? What are these ball circles with? Uh, right. Who spells shit like O U? Right. This is the people up in Canada. A boot. This is a boot. A Susan at home and, huh? A fucker. A freaky. Huh? Elon Musk is from Africa. Africa. The Arabs. Well, you know what? That shit fucked me up. Kanye West was like, look at Elon Musk. He looked like a, China, uh, a, a, a white Chinaman. And then uh, after that, every picture, you just can't get it out of here. Right? And even, oh, man. It, it, this, this is great. So... Um, and then we have villages, and they get bigger up into um, big cities like we see up here. And all through here, we've got the cities. Here's another one. Here's another one. And right across what is now the Sahara Desert is and it's all the names of all the towns and regions. It's all named. So it's all 
Sus is pig, and they had this shit named Sus back there. Sus, right here. Sus Tarudent. Look at this. Sus. Well, I thought I saw it at an angle, too. So, yeah, that, that could. If we look up Sus and this says Latin, then this is where the Latin kingdoms were as well. So that makes sense if all these are uh, Canaanites and Latins because he's sitting there telling you they're using, uh, you know, uh, the other one's telling us Hercules caves over here. <laughs> so, you know, this is this is right here is the, the, the Atlas Mountains, right, coming up to you here. And then, uh, you know what we should actually see on here? We should see uh, such shit called Atlantis should be up here on this map too. It should just be a ring of circles in here. And, you know. Yeah, Breebers. So here you say Breebers again. This is their bloodline. They're not just using that over and over again every inch of the map. Arabs. So I'd assume they're trying to say the difference between the Arabs and the Breebers. Maybe, you know. Who knows? Settled and, and you know, there's villages and cities everywhere. Here's another one. Um, mountain ranges here, you know, see towns, villages, and these rivers. Okay, and coming down into lakes all the way across here. So this is seventeen oh seven. And let this video catch up to the sound. Now, this is another one, again, of Barbaria, um, which is, again, the Sahara. But this one, it just says you know, in the 1600s is a uh, publication. We don't have a proper date there. But again, not. So in the 1600s, they wiped out all the visuals of those little cities. Because those little cities, don't you Arabs live there? All right? So again, this is not no. Africa that you've been told about is is conquered by Arabs. Now, are these black Arabs? Are these white Arabs? What type of shit? You know, here's right. There's Arabs and there's Berbers. So if we go today, it's Arabs and there's Berbers. It's just that we see black people. Detail, but you can see again they've got these rivers they've drawn all through what it. Before Jobber, it was late night. Oh. And we've got lions in here and a cheetah. So, uh, you know, they're definitely not desert dwelling animals. And again, across here, more rivers coming down. So this is in the 1600s. All right, so here's where he's talking about. These aren't desert dwelling animals. So this was a huge plain and the plain has been turned to desert. This one here says 1602, so 1600s again, Barbaria, and as you can see. Some... So, <laughs> this is a different map and we see the language change is just a wee bit and nobody's telling you. See, you see what happened with the first map? The first map told you which ethnicity was there. One was Arab and one was Berber. Now, this is gonna be real easy to figure out. Now, as we go further, um, Gadimese, Gadimese, I don't know if that exists today, right? That's Berdoa, right? Bekdoa, or is, nope, that's Berdoa, right? There's, it seems to be a kingdom. Toregu, Agdes, Bib, don't that, Bib, Yee. Is that 
It's like some kind of like Babylon or daughter Babylon, new Babylon. I do not know. See, this is a bar bar, but this is a bib ye a. So that's not the same thing, right? And bar ba barbaria. You see, there is some kind of line. It may be these mountains. And you see how they're trying to write barbaria on one side and then other stuff on this. So in this mountain range is barbaria. Now, this mountain range does not cut off barbaria. Right? Now, somewhere at this rock, this separates barbaria from Numidia. Biblia Interios Par is separated from this mountain range that's not named. See how the Atlas Mountains are named in the the Sar that's an S, not an F. Sargola Mons Targa Regium. Regium is uh that's a Roman word. So this might be a Roman map of of uh, of this area, and they're and they're naming the controllers of the areas. All right, Tripoli is in control is a kingdom of in control, and then this is Tripoli, Velhia, something like that. So, no, this is something very interesting, man. Because you know this is their 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 home, right? And the Arabs came in. Now again, are are we saying black Arabs or are we saying pale Arabs? I'm sorry. Okay, like uh, rivers everywhere, big lakes, towns and cities all through what is now a desert. I mean, this is really you know quite wet. A lot of rivers up the coast here. You know, you can see that again, the names of all the towns everywhere. The rivers going everywhere, big lakes, settlements, cities, right across um, the Sahara Desert in the 17, no, sorry, the 1600s. And this one here is from. Uh, it says 1500s, publication date 1500 sometimes. And here's another one. This one's back to 1700s, which is only a couple of ago. And you can see again, completely. So you see, you see those older maps are uh, seemingly what you call detrimental because those give up those ancient names. Why didn't he zoom in on the map from 1500s? Why did he skip to this map from the 1700s? So I'm pretty sure he's, he's starting to click in his head. And see, here we go over here. They say the word Swiss again, right here. There's Dissuis, and then there's S-C-H, right? That's that German shit, Scholl, Swiss. So, oh, no, 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 yeah, you yeah. see, all these maps have been around, but nobody's seen them, they're just suddenly just pouring out, Arabs, Arabs control these, Arabs, Gra Les Graf, Gras, Gracia Arabs, Esquin, Arabs, I don't know. Las Sombreras. See, again, man, that sounds like Mexicans, man. I, I, Fihig. Mar de Marco. See, this this sounds like, like French, and this sounds like Spanish or, or Mexican, Desara, right? And we call it Sahara, Desara. Like they go, oh, see, oh shit, look how there's like very little H's. Like not Royal de Tuf, 
filet. Right? If that's top filet, then that's French. That's these these people are French over here. And this Arab stuff down here, Garcia, Garcia, G A R S A, Garcia, 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 Garcia. This this is French. This is the same thing. They took everything and just went up on the map. This is the French. This is the uh, the the Mexicans and the Spanish. I don't know somewhere in here that the Swiss and shit. Uh, you know that's either between them or that's or that's the Latin. But you know I I don't I don't know. But you know I'm pretty I'm pretty sure once we see this you know what it, what it's saying. You know um or who who would be saying it built out right across the sahara um, or barbary and again there's rivers and lakes everywhere okay now we're going back a bit further this is a map from 1450 it's the fra Moreau map or cosmograph and it's quite an interesting map this one it's actually drawn upside down so this is actually Africa here going down. Um, this is, you know, Asia, Europe, Spain. So it's, it's a bit um, interesting that it's drawn upside down. But again, we have here Africa. Oh, see? Um, yeah, in Italy, looking over there at Africa, you, you already know where your shit in Italy is. And you want to be like, well, what's going on in Africa? Because we're going to conquer Africa. And so this is, this is how your world map would be. Because again, you were in Italy and you crossed the Mar Mediterranean, you you run into these. They claim it's not. See, they done told you Egypt been down here forever. Now they're saying, no, no, Egypt's up here by the mouth of the river. I thought that was good. Uh, uh, I'm not even going to get into it. And this is this the most floating Egypt one going to ever see. <laughs> oh, man. All right. I, I, I guess. <laughs> Whatever. So again, it's, this should be Judea, right? They should be right next to each other, like right. Oh, here come Libya, right here. Oh boy, look how interesting this map is. I can't, can't wait for the truth to finally be out. What is now the Sahara Desert? And when we zoom in, we get the same picture. Get these rivers going everywhere, cities everywhere, and these lakes. And as you can see in this map. There's a big inlet here in the side of Africa um, near Mauritania, and Mauritania is still there. But, I mean, look at it back in the 1400s. just built out with cities everywhere. We've got, um, I think they're rivers. They look like, I think, pretty sure, yeah, these are rivers because they're going into lakes. These are all lakes. So rivers everywhere, lakes. You know, they show us trees growing around. Now, they do have desert written here, so it looks like that. You see the desert, it'd go right here between these cities, right here between these cities, right here between these cities, over here, separate from the rest, between these cities. Now, how come on the outside of all these cities, they got little pockets of desert? All right? Okay, well. Either, either they're using the temples. Oh look, here's pyramids, right? So, what you gotta do is look around and see like, mm, you know, all you gotta do is go back to, yeah, yeah, I'll show you the title of this video, oldest maps in the world, Sahara Desert, when he showed the picture. You show the website up here, all right? Um, or again, map, map, moon, mond, monday, dress sn 1450. You type that title into Google, and this will come up for you in a link to this site. I can't see what it is. It's a uh, search, search work, Stanford education. So these, these are at the colleges. Again, paying them for an education, right? You can see this stuff, you know, in, in the past. Now that we have the internet, you know, we can, we, you know, 
and those that have enough God-given sense to look this up, you know, that, you know that, that's where these are at. Again, people are showing enough map, Fair use. Fair use. map videos that uh, other people have seen where a lot of these people, uh, things are, are, are kept. So, you know, so it's 1021, back up there. There's some, maybe some regions that were desertish, but again, you know, we've still got, um, you know, cities along here. Now, in these hills, it's kind of interesting because some of these castles look a bit buried. So I'm not sure, but again, this is the Sahara Desert in the 1400s. Arabia Felix. Um, and as you can see, well, where are we <laughs> down here? Um, it's completely built out, completely inhabited, and rivers and lakes everywhere. Now, these were all lakes, rivers, um, just, yeah, completely different to what we've been told. Because again, we get told that the Sahara has been um, a desert for five to 10,000 years. And uh, one more, okay, this is the Monte 1587, Monte Averno. Okay, so um, if we switch subjects, we spent about an hour on that subject. We'll get back to that a little bit later. Um, and we'll see the answer to why uh, Africa is covered in sand. Uh, now, let us find where the real location of the Israelites and Abraham. So, when we hear KRS-1 uh, rap that Abraham was a black man from Africa, we're going to know that he's saying black because he's disrespecting our ancestors. I don't care who his ancestor is. He's disrespecting our ancestors, saying that Abraham's legally dead. So Abraham's children are legally dead in this society. This is what he's doing. Now, we're going to go to a video that's going to prove to us where Abraham was. So, we're going to hit fair use. Fair use. And I've been down this road before. I typed in Uzbekistan. I watched a lot of videos. Here's one of the videos by Cool Vision. We're going to go over here. Here it is right here. Uh, play a couple seconds to sync up and. Uh, Four sides. It became the first UNESCO site in Central Asia. Some of the this inner castle has a rectangular form and it has gates. The Amudaria River Delta, put in this from the rest of the world, made Hiva the most unique town in Uzbekistan. Here, let, oh, it used to be the capital. Let's let's back up. Let's learn a little bit. Let's learn about this commercial. <laughs> I didn't know it was going to be a commercial. All right, so that's 22. We don't want to go back that far. Goodness. Let's learn a little bit. All right, what? Expect. It might be a carpet shop. Hara does a great job of relocating you to the 16th century. Walking around the back streets, entering the courtyard. It's a lot of fun. You don't know what to expect. It might be. carpet shop it might be a coffee house it might be a pottery i loved it in buhara there is a good choice of carpets how much are the carpets okay okay do you have any flying carpets how much are they oh it's too expensive i guess i'll just keep on shopping many of the current hotels are based in historical houses we stayed in one that used to be a house of a wealthy Jewish gentleman in the 19th century. 
Next on the list is the city of Hiva. Once you leave Bukhara, life dies out and you go in through a desert. Crazy to think that just a few centuries ago caravans were traveling through it. it must have been so difficult. And Hiva must have felt like a special place in a way that's surrounded by deserts. After traveling in the desert for days and weeks, the minarets of Hiva must have looked like spaceships back then. Remotedness from the rest of the world made Hiva the most unique town in Uzbekistan. It used to be the capital of Khorezm, a large oasis region on the Amudarya River Delta in Western Central Asia. Behind these walls is the inner castle, known as Ichan Kala. These massive protective walls of Ichan Kala were built using the clay from the nearby Amudarya River. This inner castle has a rectangular form and it has gates on four sides. It became the first UNESCO site in Central Asia. Some of the records indicate that it existed in the 10th century. And one of the legends goes like this. One of Noah's, biblical Noah's sons, Sim, was going through a desert. And he found this oasis. And he dug up a well. And he tasted the water. And he loved the water so much that he said, Havak, which means, tastes so good. And so this whole castle area was founded around that well. And it's called Havak Well. Well, I wanted to find the well and visit it, but right now it's located in a private property, and the owner of the house lives in Tashkent, and so there's no way to visit that. The very fact that it required Havak, which existed in the 10th century, and one of the legends goes like this. One of Noah's, biblical Noah's sons, Sim, was going through a desert, and he found this oasis, and he dug up a well, and he tasted the water, and he loved the water so much that he said, Havak, which means tastes so good. And so this whole castle area was founded around that well, and it's called Havak Well. Well, Havak once existed in the 10th century. And one of the legends goes like this. One of Noah's, biblical Noah's sons, Sim, going through a desert. Fair use. Fair he use. found this oasis. So this is in a city called Kiva, that's in Uzbekistan. We are Afro-Asiatic. Uzbekistan is in Asia. What are these rappers talking about? The people in Asia today do not want to be called Oriental. meaning they are not oriental, meaning the Afro-Asiatics are the oriental. I hope this is all starting to make sense. Why every rapper say the same thing. They are afro seven, right? Why, why, why not? In, in in Africa. The 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 they have you brainwashed through entertainment, through false literature, through fake maps. Through false lies within DNA. So, fair um, use. So this is the first one I came across. Um, I was just typed in Uzbekistan, and this one came up. Uh, and they were traveling around to different different parts of Uzbekistan. Now, let's go into this one. Yeah. You're watching Vaga Brothers, and this is Uzbekistan. I'm Alex. 
Alex. I'm Marco. And you are watching Vaga Brother. And right now we're exploring the Museum City Kiva. Alright guys, welcome to Kiva, or as locals pronounce it, Kiva. This is a museum city because it's basically a walled pedestrian city uh, that was actually the first uh, place listed as UNESCO World Heritage Site here in Uzbekistan. Uh, everything was founded in the 6th century, but it's extremely well preserved. There's basically no new buildings here. So staying overnight here gives you the opportunity to feel what it would have been like way back in the day. Got a lot of breezes, huh? <coughs> oh, they turned that smooth camera into something different, didn't they? Isn't that weird? One of the first things that I've noticed is that there are lots of mosques. <coughs> Lots of madrasas and lots of fur hats for sale. I've never seen so many fur hats. Well, to be perfectly honest with you, last night we found ourselves in the hotel with these Japanese guidebook writers and we proceeded no it was totally us we proceeded to put away three bottles of vodka far too many oh my god so we're all pretty rough this morning and we're gonna punctuate this trip stop in the tea room the tea here in uzbekistan it's actually really nice it's a black tea but uh they put lemon in it fresh lemon and sugar and it tastes really really good um it's kind of like almost like a tonic, but I really enjoy it. It's one of my favorite things so far about Uzbekistan is the tea. You know, if I go looking for it, I'll skip it. Things that just kind of opens the door. Oasis and like a rest spot. Camels were the main way of getting around back in the day, especially in this part of the world because they go forever without water. This place, the name actually comes from a well that was discovered by the son of Noah, and this was the last place to get water before you went through the desert that we just crossed through. It's very, very far to Bukhara. It's really dry, there's no water, and so this was kind of like an oasis and like a rest spot. Now, this got my attention the first time I listened to it because there is nowhere that they talk about a well of the son of Noah except for in the Bible with Abraham and with Isaac. So again, why do you have these good Freemasons sitting here making all this music and entertainment saying, oh, you're from Africa? Now, the people that watch the constant videos, we already seen this, these videos of the construction of Africa, you know? So, again, this is what Uzbekistan has to offer for us. Again, if you sit there and say, Ooh, we should be in the, the, the land of our forefathers. <laughs> I got news for you. So, Wooden Nichols' channel has been removed from YouTube. Okay. So, two months ago, Wooden Nichols' channel got removed. Link for his new rock fin inscription. All right, so again, so now that that video of Egypt don't exist no more. All right. So 
what we have is what we have, and we just go with that. Okay. Now, this uh, this stuff I'm gonna play now. It's a little dangerous because. I don't know how truthful it is, but it is wonderful as an example. No, wait, you know what? We're going to do this a little bit later. Instead, we should actually find out what happened in Africa. So we're going to do Atlantis, Africa, and we're going to see what Bright Insight has to say. Now, um, over, see, this is a year ago, so we'll say over the years. Uh, here's 13 days ago. We're going to look at this one. Um, over the years, Bright Insight has discussed that this atlantis is in africa here again four years ago bright insight so this has been like one of his you know main diets this this subject matter all right so fair use in this video i'm going to share several astonishing new details that have come to light in the topic of the lost ancient city of atlantis and the Eye of the Sahara, which in just the last few years has taken the internet by storm as this unbelievably bizarre structure just so happens to match a dozen of the most significant similarities to Plato's description of the famed lost capital city of Atlantis. But perhaps the only thing stranger than these striking comparisons is the fact that the Rishot structure itself remains a genuine scientific mystery that continues to confound scientists to this day, as this one-of-a-kind <coughs> geological feature is like no other place found anywhere else on Earth, and has remained essentially hidden and largely unknown within the remote Western Sahara Desert of Mauritania, which only makes its distinctive nature that much more curious when you consider that so few people have still never seen or heard of it before, even including the most curious and inquisitive minds around. But let me ask you this, Joe, real quick. When you saw my video, was that the very first time you've ever seen this thing yes. before? Yeah. That's the thing. And that is the thing, because if nothing else, this extraordinarily unique anomaly should be included on the list of natural wonders of the world. But nevertheless, when you see the new lines of evidence that I'm going to share in this video, it will become exceedingly apparent that the fittingly named Eye of the Sahara is by far the most likely location for the lost capital city of Atlantis. And not only that, these new details will likely make those who previously thought that this site could not possibly be the location of Atlantis think again. So with all of that said, let me start off by sharing something particularly interesting. It is widely known that the ancient Romans were renowned for documenting everything, as the Caesars went to profound extent to accumulate knowledge and information from every location their vast empire ventured. So I have to admit that I was quite surprised to learn of someone by the name of Pomponius Maia, who was the Romans' first geographer dating back to some 2,000 years ago, and had created a sophisticated map of the known world at that time, titled The Habitable World of Pomponius Maia, something that up until recently I had never seen or heard of before. And real quick, let's not confuse this map with the ancient Greek historian Herodotus' map of the known world of 2,500 years ago, which I shared in one of my prior videos on this topic. A map that curiously listed Atlantes in the same location of the Rishat. However, the original source of this map is a bit of a mystery, as modern historians claim that Herodotus is not known to have ever created an actual map and have thus put its origins into question. So, putting that map aside, let's focus on this verifiably authentic 2,000-year-old map that has also annotated something very interesting in the Western Sahara Desert. First, notice that this map is oriented to the east in its original form, so let me go ahead and flip it to a north-south facing orientation so we can gain our bearing, and the features of Europe, West Asia, and North Africa become apparent. So. Let's now focus our attention to what is in the northwest region of the Sahara 
and observe what it annotates here, Atlantia or Atlantia, which more or less appears as Atlanteans and again in the same geographical region of the Rishat structure, which, like I've shared in my prior videos, just so happens to coincidentally match so many precise details that Plato described of Atlantis, including that the capital city was famously said to be made up of concentric circles, specifically three rings of water and two of land, which correctly matches the Rishat with water in it, which it certainly did, as I will prove to you with hard scientific data in just a moment. But the circular ring city was also said to have an opening to the sea at the south, which not only matches the southerly opening of the Rishat anomaly, but it even has existing evidence of a flow of salt water that is still visible to this day, which, and again, I will prove with hard scientific evidence shortly. But Atlantis was also said to be surrounded by a large rectangular plain, which is another arguable similarity that extends for hundreds of miles on both sides of the Rishat. But furthermore, Atlantis was said to be made of black, red, and white color stones, which is another specifically unique similarity that matches the geological nature of the Rishat. And speaking of uniquely specific geological features, this next detail that I recently learned of blew me away, as there is English literature from the year 1851 on the preliminary treaties of resources of ancient Mauritania, which describes the country as having gold in considerable quantities and even specifically states, and I quote, that it is a well-authenticated fact that previous to the discovery of America, Europe was supplied to a great extent with gold from Mauritania. How have I never heard of this before? And get... Oh, well, it's because they hide this information. That would show too much relation this. between the two countries too much relation. Mauritania was so rich in gold that several hundred years ago, a king by the name of Mansa Musa of the Mali Empire, which was a region of Africa that includes modern day Mauritania, was said to have been the richest man in all of- Now, this is what starts to come to mind as I'm watching this again. Does this mean that the Arabs are of Shem, and they are the children of Abraham, the children of Ishmael, right? Abraham had more children than just Isaac. And let's go further. Human history, so rich that he far exceeds the richest billionaires alive today. In fact, he owned gold mines, which account for more than half of the world's supply of gold today. And by the way, something else you'll find interesting related to that 1851 treaties of ancient Mauritanian resources is that it describes ancient Mauritania of having an abundance of elephant ivory, which is a significant detail considering that Atlantis was said to have numerous elephants on the island. And so it's worth mentioning that there is also existing cave art depicting elephants in the area around the Rishok as well, as I've shared previously. But I digress because another highly specific feature of Atlantis was that its center island was, was described as being geothermal in nature, and that it was said to have hot springs as well as springs of cold, fresh water, which is a reason why some have dismissed the dry, ah, barren hot use. structure as a possibility for Atlantis. So I imagine that many will find it very interesting to learn that there is a little known study of the Rishot structure dating back to the late 1990s which describes the Rishat as being a hydrothermal complex. Well, hot springs themselves are the very definition of a hydrothermal anomaly. And the fact that there is an actual scientific study corroborating this uniquely specific characteristic is significant in itself, because although the Rishat may be a dry, barren place today, we must imagine what a different landscape this region was some 11 to 12,000 years ago at the time of Atlantis. And speaking of 11 to 12,000 years ago, this is the part in the video where things get crazier and will continue to do so through the rest of the See, this is where it's getting silly because we just saw that on these maps just a few hundred years ago, the land was fertile. See, now when we go with these stories of Atlantis, now suddenly 
oh, it's been like this for a thousand years and all this shit. That's nonsense. This is a recent effect. Described as having impressive mountains to the north. So, assuming that the cliffs of the Adra Highlands don't already meet that description, there is likewise a massive mountain chain to the north called the Atlas Mountains, which were aptly named after the first known king of Mauritania, who, get this, just so happens to share the same exact name of the very first king of Atlantis, who was also named Atlas. Gee, what a coincidence. But it only gets more bizarre from here because... So again, that's going to show you that the first king in this myth and the first king in real life. Now, again, the problem is, is Atlantis is his special city and Mauritania is his country. And he is... So, yeah, man. Now, this YouTube author, how do they say? He has made it make sense, right? It now makes sense. And then as we listen to him further, he's going to explain to us why it is no longer known to us. All right? So. Fair use. Not only was the city of Atlantis described as having mountains located to the north, but also said to have rivers. So get this. Recent scientific studies have confirmed an ancient river called the Taman Reset that flowed from the Atlas Mountains and winded some 500 kilometers all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, directly in the path of the Eye of the Sahara. And if that isn't fascinating enough, just look at the date of when that river is known to have existed, 11,700 years ago, precisely within the time frame of when Atlantis was said to have been destroyed. Make no mistake, the entire region of the Sahara looked completely different at that time compared to what we see today. And the next few details that I'm gonna share may very well blow your mind. Because like I've shared in multiple prior videos, there is tremendous evidence of vast water erosion throughout the Sahara Desert, which is so extreme that it can be clearly <coughs> observed from space via satellite imagery. Make no mistake, this is not wind erosion and has been confirmed to be catastrophic levels of water erosion by subject matter experts, including even the respected Randall Carlson himself. And the overwhelmingly apparent water striations that rip right through the Rishot structure all the way to the Atlantic Ocean are evident for See right there. You can clearly see you were in a blimp or looking down from a satellite how this looks like an eye socket. And this looks like the eyeball and the pupil. Mm. That's something, ain't it? All who have eyes to see. And upon further study, it looks as if an unimaginably massive force of water had blasted its way from the Mediterranean Sea through North Africa, creating a path that just so happens to be at all the lowest elevational points through the Sahara, just as water would naturally direct itself. And this is the part where things get really nuts, because there is a little known yet unbelievably fascinating scientific study that revealed a gigantic under ocean seafloor slide off the coast of Mauritania and is referred to as the Mauritanian slide and dates back to approximately 11,000 years ago, give or take, and was, get this, believed to have been created by a tsunami. A tsunami that given the very nature of its shape would have originated from the east, as you can see from the debris field's widest point, and pushed westward to where the, the debris field eventually becomes more narrow. But not clearly from this picture, if you're arguing or debating or presenting an argument that this is a mudslide, then this cap black slide. So it's two points that were hit, but he's covering the eye of the Sahara. But we should be well aware of this up top, up top right here. Okay. This is muy importante. Okay. Because as we saw, the, the dark-skinned Arabs and the white-skinned Berbers are all affected by this. Okay. 
only that, this massive seafloor slide is located directly in front of the shot's path, as you can see from the reference locations on the study. Okay, so let's look at this. And so here's the gall here, here's the gall here, here's. So this is the ocean, all right? And this is the land, this green area. All right, so keep that in mind when you're looking at this map, so, you know, it's not too confusing. When compared to the respective locations on planet Earth. And when I say that this seafloor slide is massive, observe the legend in the lower right. From my own estimation, it is 300 kilometers or nearly 200 miles wide from east to west, and nearly 150 kilometers or 100 miles wide when measured from north to south. To put that east-west measurement into perspective, the debris field generated by this tsunami is more than 25% wider than the maximum width of Florida's peninsula. Another comparison is that it's virtually the same distance from Washington, D.C. to New York City. So the big question becomes, what on earth happened to send a biblical-sized tsunami, so to speak, through North Africa in the approximate neighborhood of 11,000 years ago? And let's be real. If the Rishad structure is indeed the actual location for the lost city, the remains of it would be found in the area of this debris field, which, by the way, is stacked layer of debris sediment and is at least a couple thousand meters or more than a mile deep. This entire area needs to be scanned with LIDAR and even drilled for examination. Now, let me keep going because this seafloor slide is not the only piece of evidence that suggests that the ocean bulldozed its way through the Sahara at the time of Atlantis, as the next detail I'm going to share is extremely significant. And I must first preface it by sharing a highly important detail that I've mentioned in prior videos, which is that the last time the Sahara was said to be under the ocean was at the time of the Trans-Saharan Seaway, which is estimated to have existed some 56 to 66 million years ago, essentially all the way back to the time of the dinosaurs. And you can distinguish the regions of the Sahara where this seaway is known to have once flowed, but here's the thing. You can also clearly observe that this seaway is not annotated to have went west over the Rishat. Rather, it went south, which is why I suggest that something else happened, something separate and far more recently that has somehow eluded scientists and researchers. And here is the smoking gun evidence which proves it. Emikusi is the Sahara's largest volcano, reaching a height of 11,300 feet or more than 3,400 meters, and is dated to be 2 million years old. And the last known lava flow... So that shit is right in the center of the desert. Um, so I want you to think about this. <laughs> this thing went off, right? And... It was right in the center of it. This affects everything, everyone, everybody. And so what is sand, right? And you go out to Utah, you get the same kind of thing, right? A bunch of sand everywhere. And then you ever look at what, like, look at ants, especially in sand. And what are they doing? And they're going and getting big rocks that they can carry and they're and they're taking them down into their hole like why why are they getting rocks why are they getting stones why are they getting minerals you know and they break them and then they break down to the most i would guess this is the most basic element which is sand right and, so I, I, you know, and then the right temperature sand turns to glass, right? I, I, this is, this is really interesting to me. You know, I'm sorry to put you through this, but occurred at the south end of Emikusi's caldera in the neighborhood of 12,000 years ago, give or take. And this is the part that is unbelievably significant because notice how the volcano is positioned directly along the clear path of catastrophic water erosion, just as we see as the wrist shot. You can literally see the line of the path that the water took and which clearly eroded and erased portions of that 12,000 year old lava flow, which means that the flooding would have had to have happened after that volcanic activity.
Whether it be 12,000 years ago or 2 million years ago at the birth of this volcano, this is hard evidence that the ocean blasted its way through the Sahara far more recently than 56 to 66 million years ago that's been claimed. And the evidence does not stop there. Because this white blemish within Emmy Cousy's caldera at 11,000 plus feet in elevation is not snow, it's salt. Salt that is said to be the rains of an ancient lake that disappeared just thousands of years ago. And not only that, small aquatic life, including gastropods, which consist of snails, slugs, limpets, uh, and other small little creatures, have been found within the caldera and have been radiocarbon dated to some 14 to 15,000 years ago. How did they get there and where did that salt come from? Because make no mistake, this salt water would obviously have to have come after this volcano's eruption, certainly not before. So let me now take you back to the Rishot structure so I can share one of the most significant details of this video. Right, wow, double commercial, same time. My stuff synced up, isn't it? Yeah. Seawater was indeed inside the Rishot at the exact time of Atlantis. Just as I've shared in other videos, all these white blemishes are indeed salt. In fact, the entire region around the Rishot and Mauritania itself is known for vast amounts of salt that are mined and exported to this day. And when you well, consider that all the... He like highlighted the wrong, he underlined the wrong thing. Like it says uh, sacks of raw salt, you know, so... Yeah, it's, it's a trip, you know. Now they, take, they go out and they mine the salt and they carry it back. You know, make a little salt money. Areas in and around the Rishot with these concentrations of salt also happen to be in the areas of the lowest elevation. It seems reasonable to conclude that seawater had once settled and evaporated here. And this next part is the smoking gun evidence, as I have found another little known study that shares how aquatic life, including mollusks, which, by the way, examples of mollusks include oysters, clams, mussels, squid, and even octopus, existed in the brackish waters within the Rishot and have dates ranging from 15,000 to 7,700 years ago, which proves that the Rishot was consumed with water at the very time of when Atlantis was said to have been destroyed 11,600 years ago. Let that sink in for a moment as the implications are massive. And let me just say, if everything I've shared so far isn't compelling enough, wait until you hear these next several arguments. First, consider that the story of Atlantis actually originates from the ancient Egyptians who claimed that they were colonists and the remaining survivors of a civilization that was destroyed in a cataclysm. And this is where the legend of Atlantis comes from, which is something that most people are not aware of. And so when you consider this next remarkable fact that was only discovered not long ago is that the Sahara was a lush green tropical landscape at the time of Atlantis. And considering that Atlantis was said to be abundant in exotic fruits and vegetation and had lush hanging gardens, when you piece together the fact that the Sahara was a known lush tropical environment at that time only further adds to these possible similarities. And listen to this. The Green Sahara existed up until approximately 5,000 years ago when it shifted to the barren desert we know it for today. However, some estimates state that this transition may have happened as recently as 4,500 years ago, which is a curious time frame as it precisely coincides with the estimated date for when the pyramids of Giza were constructed some 4,500 years ago. And that brings me to another curious observation which is that the notable Egyptian Eye of Horus is uncannily similar to the Eye of the Sahara when observed from altitude. Of course, many will consider this comparison to be a stretch. However, it certainly has a thought-provoking resemblance, does it not? But that aside, and although the Sahara Desert initially seems like the least likely place that you'd find the lost city of Atlantis, it actually makes a lot of sense when you piece together other key details. For example, Atlantis was said to be busy all day and all night, rich in trade, and with people speaking languages from all over. So ask yourself, does it really make sense to suggest that a city so vastly consisting of travel and trade would be located in the middle of a vast, dangerous ocean? I mean, would other less advanced seafaring civilizations <laughs> venture out to the middle of the ocean to hit up a local market to trade for ripe fruit, spices, and vegetables? 
Or is it far more likely that based on all the new scientific data that we have, that the region of North Africa, which we now know was connected by a diverse, massive network of rivers, which of course are conducive for travel, wouldn't that be more feasible? I mean, after all, new studies involving lost human civilizations of the Sahara have concluded exactly that. And something else worth mentioning is that Atlantis was an empire said to be made up of ten kingdoms, and I would not be surprised if any of the other nine that made up this empire would be found in the island chains found in this region, including the submerged islands such as the Azores. I am simply focusing on the capital city, which was said to be made up of concentric circles. And the Eye of the Sahara is the one location that matches that highly specific characteristic and nearly a dozen others. Heck, even the names are still the same. Now, if everything I've shared so far isn't compelling enough, the next few details will hit the nail into the coffin that the Eye of the Sahara is by far the most likely location for the lost capital city of Atlantis. Okay, so I'm gonna stop that one there. You know, if you wanna um, see the rest, which I very much encourage you to, you know, bright insight, um, you know, he's, 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 he's what it is doing pretty good for him. You know, you can go over there, give him a click, and uh, there, that'll, that'll help all that good stuff. So here's, here's gonna, let's do one more. This should, this should make, to make everything make sense. Now, here's my disclaimer that I was gonna do earlier, right? We are going to look at someone that's going to discuss DNA and the Bible. There, for what I know, are not many or, or any other public researcher. That, that, okay, so that's number one. Number two, I've seen what I'm going to show you, and I cannot say that I necessarily agree with the things that this guy's going to say. I want to show you that the movement is going to go in this direction, and by the movement going into this direction, eventually we will get the truth. Remember, the Most High said you will know them by their names. He didn't say you will know them by their DNA. So, let us listen. And again, man, when somebody comes back today, tomorrow, typing in DNA stuff, I, I'm going to view that as a level of ignorance because where is our lab, where is our cheese, where is our mouse, where is our maze, where is our beakers, where is our, uh, our, 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 our microscopes? I mean, my microscope's upstairs, no bullshit. But, you know, like like these things. Again, don't tell me about the sun, the moon, and the fucking stars if you ain't got no goddamn telescope. And don't tell me about this is how chemistry works if you don't have no lab coat and no way to run the experiment yourself. You are oppressed by a peoples that are ruling over you through knowledge. Misleading. 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 Miseducating every step of the way. So, please. Does this person we're going to watch have an agenda? I don't know. Is he telling the truth? I don't know. Well, then why are you presenting it? Because it's very interesting on, an, on a level that we have not seen before. It's two years old old now i started watching some of these videos and i sent them to people and then sister warrior sent me a video uh through email the other day i hardly check my email guys text me it'll be easier but if you're if you're in another country and it's it's free to do the email yeah, great you know i might see it i might not you know how that goes so it's funny 
two years and now this community is starting to see this exist. And it doesn't matter. Oh, I saw that two years ago when it came out. Okay, you, know, you didn't talk to nobody. You didn't make no video. You got a 12 series telling you white people are, are Africans. You know, and, 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 and their DNA shows that they came out of Asia. Everybody came out. Asian, Caucasian, Afro-Asian. Everybody came out of Asia. So this is closer to the truth than anybody else. But is it complete truth? We, we don't know yet. So let us tomato, Fair use. onion, pickle, through this and see where we get. So I'm going to start this. Who made these patterns? Two. Show your love for the Buckeye State hey. by giving Ohio props this December. Can you believe this? I thought I already got a commercial. I didn't. Okay. Sorry. Now I'm emphasizing this point for a number of reasons. Number one, you can see clear echoes of indigenous history in this Y chromosome tree. Fair Number use. two, you see them only if you have the overall young earth time scale. If so, he's, of course, I will say this, he has a book below it. You can see this or all this information right here. It's answers in Genesis, uh, ancient Egyptians, and human DNA, big surprise. Now they do this. They're, they're not very direct. They beat around the bush with it. He's, of course, he's trying to um, sell his book. The book he has is called Traced. I think this is his name. <laughs> this is where the link goes to. So, and this this is his goal. Now, um, trying to see if his name is down here. Make sure this is who we're dealing with. Yeah, Nathaniel, Dr. Nathaniel J Jensen, Harvard trained. All right, and again, he's going against the the curve. Now he's saying if you if you listen, if you take the time and watch these videos, I encourage it. They might be a little slow. You can speed up the time, you know, as long as you can hear what he's saying. He's saying he's attempting to match the D and the, the haplo groups to people of the Bible and the Bible timeline. No. If you were to convert these dates, or excuse me, if you were to ask the question, what are the dates assigned to these branches within a mainstream view of history, these would go back thousands of years. I think even before the originalization, you completely lose this history of migrations and correlations with the volunteer speakers. But you see it when you have the Young Earth time scale. This, this, is, this is a time scale that works and makes sense of human history. Okay. Volunteer speakers start up here. Genetically, it looks like the earliest branches of E1B1B -B are in West Africa. And later ones are down here in Central and Southern Africa. There's this clear echo. Okay, okay, I forgot to mention this, so I've got the dates in my notes. Mainstream time scale would put these dates not just a few centuries ago, but 6,000 to 10,000 years ago. The Young Earth dates are the ones that work. The, e, the, the <coughs> thing I'm looking at is that E1B1A appears to be the genetic echo of the bond to expansion. And you only see this when you have the Young Earth time scale. So this would seem to put the origin of E1B1A out here in West Africa, at least several. So, Let's stop and reflect on this. E1B1A seems to fit the history of the Bantu expansion. It seems to then imply that in the 1500s, 1400s, 1200s, E1B1A, those people were in Nigeria, Cameroon, West Africa area. I just mentioned a few minutes ago, we concluded that E1B1B has multiple lines of evidence pointing towards its origins in Arabia. Yet some now, that shows you E1B1B's origin is in Arabia. Okay? So, here comes all these people. Black people is E1B1. E1, you know, so, again, yeah, here comes, this is why I say we don't have these lab coats. We don't have the labs. We, we don't collect people's spit and run DNA tests. So, if we don't understand this, 
And of course, people are going to say, I do understand this. And, and again, man, technically you don't. This is why somebody like this comes out and says, on, on his behalf, this is what it is. Everything else is a lie. Now, I have no choice but to listen. I do the same thing on this channel. Unfortunately, it's clear to see we've been taught lies on every subject. All the public school people. Now, what do they teach in the colleges? I don't know. I didn't go. I mean, I went to college, but not for this stuff. I went for graphic design. You know, not, you know, I didn't anything from you in graphic design. Somehow, these two branches were once in the same spot. Why do I say that? Because you see. So to put this on the map, so you can see what we're talking about, I'm saying 1500s would put E1B1A individuals out here. In the 600s, <coughs> E1B1B individuals were probably right here, and then expanded across North Africa, Middle East, into Europe, into Central Asia as a result of these conquests. Where is the most likely spot of origin for the ancestor to both of these groups? Notice that the geography connecting them is almost exclusively African, and the line, straight line that would connect them to places goes through Sudan and Eritrea. <coughs> That's interesting to me because if you go back in time to history that precedes the dates I've given for both of these, so I said I can trace you back to the 1500s AD for E1B1A, I can go back to the 600s AD for E1B1B, go back before both of these in this section of the globe, and you have a kingdom known as Axum that connects Northeast Africa and the Arabian Peninsula. This would seem to fit and imply an origin of E1B1B and E1B1A, the ancestors to them, somewhere over here in Africa with, in the first few centuries after Christ, some of E1B1B ending up in the Arabian Peninsula. And if we had time, I could tell you about some subsequent work that seems to confirm exactly that, even earlier branches of E1B1B than the ones I've shown you in this particular study that are found right here, exactly as I would have predicted. The point I'm driving at in, in, in this right here suggests that the ancestors of both these groups lived somewhere up here. If we had time and I go through this in the book, I could give you geographic reasons why this seems to fit, given how Africa is surrounded by water, and then the north has the Saharan Desert to keep invaders out, and the most likely point of origin for entry into Africa. That is a kick-ass map, isn't it? They don't really show the mountain ranges that we were seeing before. You show some of them, you know, more than the ones. That's, I still like that. That's a great map. Africa from the outside is down here through northeastern Africa. All that to say, every moment in life is a bet, like betting on these discount snacks. The data seem to put these people, the ancestors to these groups in northeastern Africa. And then something happens apparently in the 700s to 400s BC that sends them on their separate ways. What possibly could have happened? Well, this time frame just so happens to overlap with a period of Egyptian history in which the pharaohs were of Nubian origin. Nubia would be basically modern Sudan. The 25th dynasty of Egypt from about the seven 20s, 719 BC to the 650s BC was these, were these dark-skinned individuals from Sudan. And that is right in line with the dates right here. Now, why does it end in the 650s BC? It ends because of the invasion that I referred to earlier in this lecture, the Assyrians. The Assyrians come, come in, they sack Egypt, drive out the Nubian pharaohs. Perhaps this is what sent and then split up this population. About 10 seconds. Yeah. Two groups and sent them on their way, as the genetics seem to imply. So just to summarize, E1, 
B1, the ancestor to E1B1A and E1B1B, appears to have been in the first millennium BC up this way, and then later on split into these two groups. My point is, most, or excuse me, the plurality of Egyptian males belong to E1B1B. If you go back 1600, 1400 years, you would conclude that the plurality of Egyptian males are Asian in origin and not African. The plurality of Egyptian males are Asian in origin. Did you hear that? I didn't catch that before. 1600, 1400 years, you would conclude that the plurality of Egyptian males are Asian in origin and not African. However, the Arabs themselves, at least in part, appear to have originated from a Northeast African group who themselves may have sat on the throne of ancient Egypt. Yeah, don't that make sense when we sit there and say these Hamites uh, that are Canaanites, there's a distinct pattern for the Canaanites, but there's some sub-branches. One is Arabic looking, one is whatever kind of, you know, uh, Libyan, Lebanese, right? See, and then if you sit there and say, these people came in, and these people came in, and then these people came in, and from these subdivisions of populations are being created, or sub-branches from the forefather, which would be the children, are being created, and then it starts to, to make sense, because what do we have here? We have an array of different people who, who look as different ethnic groups, but they're actually all the same brothers or cousins, however you want to view it. Because again, the Lebanese, the, the, they're telling you the Philistines had this and this and their city was in Asia, but Chinese people live there now, the Sinite. Well, it didn't say that the Sinite was the Philistine. The Philistines have red hair so the blonde and red hair were the philistines and they left asia how they left by choice or pushed out it doesn't matter the israelite that we're told the name to use is raw ale is what the bible actually say in the dictionary, the Bible dictionary, strong, strong, strong supportance. So Israel was removed from India, so deported from India and moved to a place unknown. Africa well known at this time. America is not. Those books say they was taken to Mexico, the lost 10 tribes of Mexico, the Mexicans. And the Mexicans spread through the Americas, and this is how you get your American Indian with Afros, because they're Afro Asians from India. Now, Jerusalem is one thing, the city of Judea is a totally different thing. Edom captures the Judeans and takes them. Now, who takes down Jerusalem? Well, they say Rome does it, but the Bible says something different. The Bible say all these different nations partook. They were the people of the prince. Now, if you throw down all these people holding the ball in the cross, these are the people of the prince, the kings that accept. Remember, God gives you the right to be king. But as king, you get a choice, and right? Jesus puts you in, a, in, a, in a, an assembly of Psalms 83. 
and they went to the wise and crafty ones. That ain't man going to other men. That's second creation, Adam going to first creation, snake people. Well, there's a war between us. Why did they go to them? See, now this is going to start to answer all the questions. If we tell you how to topple them, then what do we get in return? You know what they get in return. You'll get your picture on the cup of milk carton. You'll get your picture on the back of a milk carton. Not anymore. Now you go up on a wall in Walmart, right? Are you, are you getting, you know, mysteries of went to the national park? So it does seem that after all, the plurality of Egyptian males are indeed African in origin. A part of Africa that is in close geographic proximity to ancient Egypt. It implies some sort of Fair connection. Use. So this sort of messy interconnectedness implies that modern Egyptians may indeed be the descendants of some of the pharaohs of old. This is the type of thing you can do for, in theory, any other civilization, any other people group on the planet. That's the main thing this book Trace does. It's first and foremost a history book that fills in the story that I never learned in school, that you may have not ever learned in school, the history of the peoples of the planet. Okay, so let us think about something. He said that E1B1 is Egyptian. Okay, so now, I mean, Egyptians are from Ham, all right? And so, <clears throat> this becomes the question, how well do they understand DNA? All right, now, just the politics, the religion, the culture, but the peoples themselves. I've filled in part of the rest of the story for the ancient Egyptians. We'll get to that, to the, to the early question, the, the origin of these peoples in a moment. What I want to walk through now very quickly in the few minutes that we have together that remain is some of the other major ramifications of this new Rosetta Stone of human history, this DNA-based generation by generation family tree for global humanity that just so happens to record history within the young earth time scale and in future episodes of, of this youtube series we're going to talk about some of the scientific backstory to this as well as some of the responses to the critics what i'm going to do now is very quickly sketch some of the other ramifications that again subsequent episodes in this series will go into more detail so to give you a, a metaphor in a sense this new rosetta stone holds many secrets. The first secret is the history of the peoples of the globe. The second secret is what I'm going to call the prehistory of peoples. So if you're a creationist, you might associate the term prehistory with cavemen or uh, you know, dinosaurs or prehistoric. There's, in a sense, an ambiguity, I guess, in this term prehistory, because it's used to refer to things that creationists would reject millions of years of history. It's also used in human history context to refer simply to the era before written records, and that's the fundamental meaning of it. So if you're a creationist, you might use the term prehistory to refer to the post-Babel, pre-written records era. Pre-Columbian history is one of the perhaps most, most well-known eras that fits this description. Sure, creationists would say the Native Americans originated after the confusion of languages at Babel. Some eventually landed in the Americas. But either they didn't write their history down, or if they did, it was lost, destroyed. Pre-Columbian era is considered, in mainstream science, a prehistory pre era because of this lack of written records different from other parts of the globe. This new Rosetta Stone has explosive ramifications for how we understand this era. I've got a whole other video on this that, that I encourage you to see. And again, it's, it, there's a whole chapter on this in the book. Today's Native Americans do not appear to have been the first. There have been multiple settling, settlings of the Americas. 
And it appears, just like we saw for the for the Bantu-speaking peoples in Africa, the Native Americans themselves have written this down, and it's been neglected by mainstream science or completely rejected because it doesn't seem to fit the time scale or for whatever reasons they invoke. When you've got this new Rosetta Stone, the data match up in a remarkable way. And there's again so much more we can talk about. I don't have time to do so in this lecture. The same sort of analyses Fair with use. major ramifications you can do in other parts of the globe that are currently Fair under the label prehistory, pre-colonial Africa, pre-colonial Pacific, these sorts of things. There's there's major ramifications here. One of the secrets. So he's telling you it's different things to look up under search text. You know, pre-colonial. The parts of the globe that are currently under the label <laughs> prehistory, pre-colonial Africa, area. pre-colonial Pacific, these sorts of things. There's there's major ramifications here. One of the secrets of the new Rosetta Stone is on um, what we can understand and learn about so-called prehistory. Third secret of this new Rosetta Stone. I'm going fast, again, for sake of time, and there's subsequent lectures that cover this in more detail. If you look at the biblical history of the globe and read, it, read the Bible in a straightforward way, it says humanity starts with Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago. Their descendants multiply. Eventually, they go wicked. God decides to destroy everyone on the planet except Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. They restart after this global flood. And Genesis 10 records the male descendants of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And for, again, reasons I don't have time to go into, I would argue that these 70 or so names in Genesis 10 represent the earliest heads of the ethno-linguistic groups that were separated at the Tower of Babel. I've just zoomed through a bunch of biblical history for sake of time. My point is, these are at the fountainhead of the human race after the flood, according to the Bible. I'm gonna, and, and this diagram right here represents just a, just a facsimile, basically of the genealogical details in Genesis 10. In chapter 13 of this book, so 12 goes to Native American history, chapter 13 of Traced, I walk through multiple independent lines of evidence that show at the base of the Y chromosome tree, there's almost a mirror image of that history. It's okay, so now we have a, I believe, geneticist who is willing to say these are Ham, these are Shem, and these are Japheth. Now, again, this is what I'm talking about. Now, all these melanated people done went around teaching you that you are E1B1. Now, I just showed you when you look at the Berbers, they're E one B one. So, who is tricking you? Okay, who is tricking you? You know who it is. It's these Freemasons. Just do the shortcut. Right. So, here's a Berber E1 B1. Excuse me. E1 B1. Yeah. The parent class throughout East Africa, prehistoric times. Or, oh, blah, blah, blah. Cole equally refers to the Berber mark for its prevalence among the Mo Mozabite Middle Atlas. We just saw the Atlas Mountains, so we know what the Middle Atlas is. And other Berber speakers, E M, is also quite common among North African groups. And we're asking about the Berbers, not North African groups, groups right? So here they go, E1M or E1B1. Now, you see how confusing they are with that? Which one is it? But now we do see that Berber is E1B1.
B one A here and E one B one B up top. So who who do you trust? Are you sure? So here again, here's you will half a group E is considered the marker for Berber. Right? So E one B one M dash M eighty one is frequent in North Africa, particularly among the Berbers. So who are all these people? This is nature dot com saying this, right? Who who do you, who do you trust? You know? Right? So now the other lineage of the Berber and his history, right? All right. Both Arabic and Berber speaker Tunisia, however, no traces of E one B one A. But everybody else was saying it was there. And so I mean what is this, you know? And the subgroups here are most common and the half a group in Africa, right? So again. Who do you who do you believe? Are you sure? Why? why? Sh shouldn't everything say the exact same thing because everybody should be using the same data, saying the same. Fair use. That's this, this becomes my question. You know. Fair use. It's, it's remarkable to me. The subtitle of this book is Human DNA's Big Surprise. There are there's many surprises. We could have made it plural in this book. This is one of the biggest shocks. To me. This is, uh, I had an early book in, in February 2021 that didn't have this data and a deeper study of the scriptural data in, in April of 2021 led me to a number of other biblical lines of evidence to, to a deeper understanding of what the Bible says about the fate of these men in Genesis 10. And with that biblical data on hand and the history I'd already worked out for the Y chromosome, there's this tremendous overlap that emerged and you can see the details again in chapter 13. Nothing says tasteful like a round of shots. Okay. In theory, every single people group on this planet can trace their ancestry back to specific men in Genesis 10. And here's where I can fill in then the beginning of the story of ancient Egypt, or really the beginning of the story of E1B1B and its ancestor E1B1. Mizraim is listed in Genesis 10. Mizraim is who the Bible identifies as the ancestor of the Egyptians. Does the E branch trace back to Mizraim himself? Mizraim was a son of Ham. And the way I've worked this tree out, E1B1B is on the Hamitic side of the tree, as is E1B1A. Zooming in here so you can see that names from Genesis 10. There's Mizraim. Kush is also a son of Ham. This, this scripture seems to imply that Kush gave rise to the Sudanese, the Ethiopians, the, these Northeast Africans, Mizraim again, to the Egyptians. I don't yet have a precise answer. There's some more data still to be gathered. If I had to guess, I would say E1B1B is likely from Kush, not from Mizraim. But then again, Kush and Mizraim, Kush and Egypt, the Nubians and the Egyptians had a constant back and forth throughout their ancient histories. Okay, so now Doc is kind of, to the outsider, it probably seems, and I'm on the outside, that's why I'm making the statement, you know, it seems like Doc is kind of backtracking a little bit, you know, because um, he already said E1, B1 is the, the Egyptians. Now he's saying it's the Kush. Kush, right? Now he's saying it all special. Okay? Now remember, um, what we have down here, he is working uh, with a good doctor. Um, and I think the doctor's name is 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 this Doctor Ken Ken Ham. Now it's funny when you go to this another video uh, of the Romans, right? He, he, him and Ken is going to sit there and talk about how they have the same blood. Now, uh, now watch this. This, this is where it's going to get uh, inter entertaining. If it, this, this isn't the cliffhanger you wanted to see. 
Like, oh, it's gonna get, it's gonna get there. Fair use. Oh, okay. So, you know, he done already showed us. Fair use. I have made a map of the DNA spectrum, and I know who is Ham Shem and Japheth. Now he's gonna go further into it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Buckle up. So it's almost six of one half of the other. When you when you think about how history is played out after Babel. Third secret of this Rosetta Stone is the genetic echo of Noah and his descendants as recorded in Genesis 10 at the base of the Y chromosome tree. There's another biblical echo in this tree that I'm calling a separate secret. Zooming in here on the Semitic line, traced down in Genesis 10 through our facts, said Salah, Eber, and Peleg. If you go to the genealogy genealogical data in Genesis 11, Peleg's offspring are traced down to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And once again, you have an exquisite genealogical detail, which I give again in, in chapter 13 of the book. Whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down, buddy. Now, I want you to pay attention, because in a minute, he's going to say he is R1B. And when he say he's R1B or something of this nature, he will say that he from Shem. And then him going to say that him from Jacques Tom. I, I, I don't want to surprise. I don't want to surprise nobody. I want y'all to know it's coming. You got to see it coming. All right? Because, you know, this is why I say, I don't know if this data, how real it is, how real it's not. But, you know. That echo, which implies then that there's branches of the tree that represent the direct genealogical descendants of Abraham. There may be... Order my book now. I'm just joking. Let me rewind this just a touch. And we'll get the match. In. Echo, which implies then that there's branches of the tree that represent the direct genealogical descendants of Abraham. There may be a little bit of ambiguity whether or not this is Isaac or Ishmael. I, in the book, I lean towards Isaac, Jacob, and such. It's clearly Abrahamic, whichever way you take it. Fair use. That's a remarkable echo that you can see in the tree as well. Fourth secret of, the new, of, of this new Rosetta Stone. Fifth secret. Okay, so again, he's telling you the secrets of his book. Get his book. And he's going to tell you who is who is who. An application of what I just described to you. You and I, if you're a male, can be found on this tree. I've had my Y chromosome tested. Like so many people of Western European descent, I belong to R1B, or my family line belongs to R1B. I can tell you that R1B goes back to one of the sons of Jochten, who's a descendant of Shem. That's the type of thing you can do. You can, And, and I should clarify here, because I've had uh, many people write to me about this sort of research. I think all of us tend to assume there is one son of Noah that we come from. And if I, if I take a Y chromosome test, I'm going to find the one son of Noah that I come from. Well, all of us have a complicated family tree, multiple genealogical inputs. The Y chromosome represents just a single line of unbroken male descent that I've tried to highlight here in this diagram. My Y chromosome got from my dad, who got it from his dad, who got it from his dad, and on back in the tree. Well, what about my dad's mother's side, or my mother's mother's side, or my mother's father's side? There's ways to try to access this with the Y chromosome as well. And so if you're a lady watching and, you know, how, how are you leaving me out? I'm not. There's, there's ways both men and women have to deal with this question. And the way to do it is to find male relatives on that part of the tree. Dad's mother's side, see if you can find dad's mother's brother or dad's mother's brother's son or someone along that part of the tree who can get a Y chromosome test. We've had my mother's brother have his Y chromosome tested. We've been exploring my wife's side of the family tree. My father-in-law's had his Y chromosome tested. My mother-in-law's brother has had his Y chromosome tested. And for some of you, you may not have to do anything. For my father-in-law's mother's side, there was already a Facebook page dedicated to the origin of the family name, and multiple males had taken a Y chromosome test. So, so you might be able to uncover your family history just sitting at your computer. The point being, all of us, every family line can trace their ancestry in theory back to specific sons of Noah. 
and I want to emphasize this point mm -hmm. because there's an element of mystery here mm -hmm. that you might be a part of. You might have an answer to a mystery. I said here there's a, there's a mirror image of this genealogy of Genesis 10 in the Y chromosome tree. I should clarify, there are 70 names listed here in Genesis 10. Mm -hmm. There are not 70 ancient lineages at the base of the tree yet. 99% mm -hmm. of the men on the, on the globe today have yet to get a Y chromosome test. Some of you watching, lineages at the base of the tree yet. 99% of the men on the, on the globe today have yet to get a Y chromosome test. 99% of men on the globe today have failed to test. So you, you mean, okay, so 99% of men have failed to get a paternal test. Hmm. I wonder why. Is it because men are less likely to buy, buy into that? I can't I can't say men are less likely to buy bullshit because that, that's just not true. Why is it that the percentages is that we don't have to wonder about? men versus women or anything like that 99 percent of men across the lineages at the base of the tree 70 names listed here in genesis 10. Hmm? there are not 70 ancient lineages at the base of the tree yet 99 percent of men on the globe today have yet to get a y chromosome test and then amazing Some of you watching use. may 99% all of us watching, every man watching this with a pair of testicles, uh, well, that's what denotes they're a man. So again, man, if you sit there and say 99, this is the only guy, right? Him and, him and the guy he's working with. Again, why should you blindly trust your DNA to a company when again? There's very few female stalkers out there. I I don't I don't I myself never really thought about this until this moment. Men don't sit there and say, Well, I don't know what my future's like, so if like I decide to stalk a bitch later in life, you know, like I don't wanna put my DNA on the record, that's all. Hey, but but seriously, now that the police have access to the DNA uh, records and companies, and they can do business that way, no, I mean that's that becomes a oh excuse me, very dangerous uh, slope, and I'm sure this is why men uh, don't do this because you know they're not dealing uh, with um 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 legal documents to say once these tests are done i want uh, any and all of my dna returned they're signing documents to say once i spit in this do vial uh, uh you know, we promise we're gonna throw you <laughs> we promise we're gonna throw your dna away, DNA away. Ah, they're selling all kinds of information why would they throw your dna away i wonder if legally can you does, does the legal definition of throw in a way really mean, right? Can it, can it, can it, can it like, call call legal, whatever that was, with the word sale, you know? See, this is why I wonder. It's just legal ease, like, oh, we'll dispose of it properly through contract with other people. Right? You belong to one of these yet undiscovered ancient lines. You may have in your DNA, some of the secrets to the lost people of the ancient past. Oh, who's the only lost people? Hmm? Only lost people are the Israelites. See the whole game. See? I mean, 
It's these keywords. All right. So, again, if this guy, if this guy can go into DNA and say, oh, look, this is what it says. to ancient Egypt. This is what it says. And now he's dictating through book who's what. See, that means for years, how old is he? Right? Instead of getting drunk with the idea, I can be a basketball star, I can be a rap star, right? Could have been a scientist. <laughs> and you could have been able to figure out the truth to all this. But clearly, that shit is somebody else's job. Whether he's telling the truth, lo and behold, we won't know. Because we do not have the power to reverse math his findings. All we can do is go to the internet and see if what matches and what doesn't. And then well, it's just a coin toss, you know, which what well, what we believe then. It either backs our hypothesis or it does not. Now, we watch this video. He tells you that people migrate from Asia into Africa. Okay, that supports uh, my, my, my hypothesis. We watch this video, and he sits there, and he says, but Africa, uh, that are Arabs, they're, they're actually, they're Hamites, you know. So, again, does that support my hypothesis? Uh, I don't really even know. All I know that book says they started in the East. Remember, I was brainwashed just like everybody else, and for fucking years, I'm talking the same thing. Jesus can be your friend. Hey, no. When I discovered the truth, I started putting my face out there, preaching, putting whatever I had in my pocket into it. Catholic Church did this to us. I took a protest to Washington. I met 13 kind and nice and loving people, even one that was, he was nice, but he, you know, he was, he was against the whole thing, but he was like, I'll just support you because I ain't got nothing else to do today. <laughs> I think he, was, he himself was a Mason and he was the low man on the stick that, that's just my opinion. You know, he, you know, he just says he's none of that. He's just a trucker, blah, 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 blah. Hey, man, okay, if, if you say that's what's what, you know, that's that's what's what. But, you know, there's there's a lot more to all this than, than we truly understand. You know, he's telling us he, E1, B1, and, and the Egyptians. Ooh, we've got some hectic play going on over here. You know, um... And so, I wanted to be able to show you that he's making this great claim that, oh, okay, the line of Abraham is either T or it's L. Okay, well, I've never heard anything like that in my entire life. And so now, just like everybody else, we have the ability to say, oh, okay, so I'm interested in what is haplogroup T. You know, and uh, what are they going to say? Is it pushing Africa in this image, I guess? I mean, I. I, I I have, we have to look, uh, because, you know, nothing's really saying anything, you know, let's see, who is, who is T? Oh, okay, Western and Central, Western and Central Asia and Europe, okay, so that's a very broad spectrum. Is T who, 
what haplo group is the royal family? What haplo group is Oliver Einstein? King Tut, they're just, okay, so ancestors of you're Asian, so Europe and Asia, so they're Middle East, right? That's what they're arguing, right? T is affiliated with Sephardic Jews. Um, excuse me. <coughs> Never swallow that shit, man. Yeah, nice. Fucking brothers be up there. <laughs> Swallowing that shit. Oh, fuck. Don't do that. Don't spit that shit out. So, what are the genetics of tea? They're not, I don't think they're going to be too uh, foretelling. Where'd that go? Oh, boy. This has given us more of a location, right? Throughout Europe and parts of the Middle East, North Africa. All right, so, you know, whatever. We're going to have to go into that a little bit more. And L, right? We done read before when L comes up. Now he's telling us this, you know, the Internet's telling us L is all over Africa. Now, again, man, if we go over here to this cat's video, and he starts going over Africa, He's going to show us all over Africa is E1, B1, and uh, other, other stuff. Okay, so they, they got to they gotta play this. Got to pay some bills, don't they? Everybody's got bills. So, again, they're arguing that the Arabs of T, T is in Africa and in Europe, the Middle East. See, this is the same thing that they're saying about E1B. E1B1B. Lower portions, higher portions. So, again, that's this, this is still the argument. Oh, these are the peoples in these regions that are... are we know today are, are, are more so Canaanites and, and Europeans. And as we learned with the map, that the, in these region of Africa, they're, they're, in, the, in, the, in the 1400s, they were Arabs. Down in here, down throughout in here. And then what were we reading? French words through here? Hispanic words to hear, and Arab, 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 with with throughout all of it. So again, we go to the project. Welcomes anyone? Uh, y haplo group L L haplo group is found in South Asia, Western Asia, and in Europe. So again, they're not they're not really giving you a specific location, right? And again, you ask for L and they give you K. Known as the branch of K is known as L. Who decided? Who decided this Dewey Decimal System? This, this isn't that great. First off, if you're looking for seven, the children, 70 DNA sequences, we, there's only 26 letters of the alphabet. You, you probably should have went with number first. And, and this is reconstructing ancient mitochondrial DNA leaf between. So, again, if, if, here's a question. If we deal with Google and the top searches come back just to be stupid or waste of time, then we can get where they're just trying to hide things from us. 
Now, the importance of a VPN. <laughs> just... <laughs> All right, so you ask about L. L is mostly in West Asia and South Asia. So, you know, this is why I say, who do you trust and are you sure? From the words and the maps, we see who was in Africa. Now, DNA wants to say, oh, it's different than what, you, what you've been told, what you've been taught. And now this DNA researcher says, oh, no, it's completely different from that, and here's why. No. The problem is he's closer than everybody else. Everybody started in Asia, and they moved their way out based on territory that's claimable. That should be known to everybody. It's not, because they teach that everything started in Africa, and then that's how it went. So, this is why I say this researcher is closer than everybody else, but then here is the, he is jocked, and, and the other guy, Ken Ham, is jocked, and so th this, is, this is how it gets a little weird. Either... You guys are not telling the truth or what you're testing up against is mislabeled. We all know when we go into Yamnea, Yamnea is R1B1. Yet when we watch this character, he says he is R1B1 or R1B or something. So clearly he is from that Yamnaya tribe but him is, thinketh nobody that watcheth gonna realize this this is so in another video in the Roman uh, video him and Ken Ham are sitting there talking about their DNA saying I'm I'm R1A I mean, I'm R1B and Ken's R1B1A and there's some shit you know I, 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 don't, I don't know it, it don't seem that important to really tack it on to this, but I, I want you to kind of see as we get closer the truth will come out and it's completely different than what we're told here. Okay, I guess we're going to end off this with if anybody's interested in this book. Uh, there, that's how you get it. You can go to, this is the Answers in Genesis YouTube page. In the bottom of it, a link to this website. It's their store. This is his book. It's uh, Dr. Nathaniel Jensen. Uh, I want to take a moment and thank uh, Jamil. Nasif L. I want to thank Jamil and the family of the Nasif L. Uh, Victor, Victor. Uh, I don't know uh, which last name is, man. Thank you. I want to thank Arthur Scott, man. Thank you, Arthur. Uh, Tehran Lamar. Thank you, Tehran and the Lamar family. Thank you, Deshaun and the Jenkins family. Thank you, Christian and the Morrow family. Thank you, Sean and the Lloyd family. I, I, I really appreciate you guys. Um, thank you, Shelly Jackson. Shelly and the Jackson family. Thank you, Levi and the Adams family. It's been tough times for everybody out there. You see in the news, people just keep... Uh, it's horrible, horrible news stories, man. You know, Indiana seems to be going through it, man. Every time you turn around, something going on in Indiana. Ooh, guys, be careful out there. Be careful, be careful, you know. Um... I suggest you, you you stock up and load up on what you what you need to for a while, and uh, think that you know uh, we need to, to to get out of here. You know, get out of these cities. They're they're a cauldron. They're a pot for us to be uh, destroyed in. 
Hey, I want to thank Jared Davis. I want to thank Kane and the Thompson family. Um, I want to thank uh, the Juwan and the Manuel family. L ladies and gentlemen, without your help, this is very hard to do. I'm not going to give you some bullshit about, I can't do this without you. Uh, you know, it's just harder, you know, you know, and, and closer to you need to get a job or something like that. You know, those type things. I don't do this to, to receive their advertisements and, and have all this stuff, you know. Uh, I do this because I grew up in a society that tricked me. And I sat and I thought about all those motherfucking people that that done died believing in a false idol, false gods, and all kinds of other bullshit. And I thought, if people didn't try to show me, I'd have just been another one of those dead people. Something in me said, let me just broadcast. And again, man, people can argue that it's ego, that people want to see themselves. But it, it, I, I don't know, man, because you got to put in all this time. You know, I put in, you know, three hours here. So, you know, two hours, 46 minutes. So, you know, that's, that's, I didn't do this with the family or I didn't do this and then, you know, uh, whatever. And I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it can't be about the ego if you have to deal with with the sweat and the tears over it. Let people say what they're going to say. Um, look, I appreciate people helping out and sending videos. Listen, I have no interest in anything that's going to be on the uh, uh, channel like redirected or, 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 or anything like that. Look, those people... They take, and they don't give. So, uh, and again, they call on a false god. They call on a god that everybody sacrifices to. Just like that person called the 12, talking Yah, Yah, Yah. Yah is the Egyptian moon god. They show you in this movie called King Arthur. When they sacrifice, they have to take the body to the, 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 the snake women. I don't care if you call them harpies. I don't care if you call whatever. On screen, you saw the serpent-looking women. Okay? When that guy kills his wife, he calls out to Yah. Then he takes the body, and when he kills his daughter, he screams. And then he calls out to Yah afterwards. If these people that say they your spiritual leaders ain't got enough good goddamn sense to study what they preach, then they leading you astray through entertainment. Because all they're doing is they're entertaining you. I don't care if they like, we want it to come off like a funeral. To some people, funerals are entertaining because they get the dress, they funky ass out. So, again, I appreciate people sending me stuff. I know the reason you're sending me, but, but they don't do no homework. So they don't stole it from somebody else and it exists, it exists somewhere else on the internet. Again, if I sit there and start teaching about SLC 2485 and ain't nobody on the internet talking about this at all. And then once I do it, then the white man do it, and then they go find a video that the white man do, and then they present the video, why in all the other videos they talking bad about the white man who they just lifted all the white man's properties and displayed it on these channels so they can make some monies? You're very hypocritical! <laughs> yeah, that shit don't... You're very hypocritical. So, again... 
false god worshiping hypocrites backstabbing stealing uh, other people's material you know so again i expect a white man to steal that's why i make these videos you see they took down wood nickel's channel why they take down wood nickel's channel that Negro over there found out Egypt ain't real. And it's all because of him. Take his channel down. If you take the Negro's channel down, you'll make him a martyr. <laughs> you'll make him angry. You don't want him angry. So, Shalian, see you soon. You know we're going to be seeing each other soon.